Good morning, boys and girls. So we are ready for our mystery continent of the day. And so yesterday we learned about North America and we learned about how we live in North America. We learned some facts about it and we learned about the different countries that come in it and even some of the animals that live there. Well, today we're gonna learn about a new continent and I have this bag of items that has some mystery things in it that might help us figure out what continent we're working on. Are you ready? So the first thing that we have is I have these little shoes that are called clogs. So they're wooden shoes. Hmm. I wonder in what country do they wear wooden shoes at? Next, I have this replica of the London Bridge. So the London Bridge, it's a very famous bridge. Hmm. And last, I have this arch. It's part of what they call the Colosseum. So this is an old arch. You can tell it's somewhere that has buildings from a long time ago and all this different um, art that's on the front of it. So hmm, if we have those three things, I wonder what continent we're going to talk about. Hmm. Europe. We are gonna talk about Europe today. And some things about Europe is it's the second smallest continent. The only continent that's smaller in size is Australia than Europe. It includes 43 different countries. So even though it's small, it still has a lot of countries. It has the world's smallest country and the world's largest country in it. So the Vatican City is the world's smallest. The um, Russia is the largest and a lot of Russia actually is in Asia too. It goes over both continents. And most countries in Europe use what we call the euro as currency, which means that they all have the same money. And it is the only continent that has no deserts. So there's no really, really dry, sandy places in Europe. So let's go ahead and figure out what our story is going to be from Europe. And our story is coming from a country called Ireland. And Ireland is actually, you can't really see it right here, but it's one of the kind of islands that come out from Europe. It's called the Irish Cinder Lad, and it's written by Shirley Clemo, and it's illustrated by Loretta Krumpensky. The Irish Cinder Lad. All right, so I'm going to project the pictures, but I'm going to have to read it off the book because the writing's really small and I couldn't read it off the, the screen if I tried to. In Ireland, in the old times, there lived a lad named Beckon. His mother gave him his this name the day he was born, for Beckon in Irish was for little one. It's fitting, she said, for such a wee little one. His mother loved him all the same and carried Beckon around in an egg basket for safekeeping. Whenever he opened his mouth, she spooned milk porridge into it, and Beckon began to grow and grow and grow. Red hair flamed on his head. His skinny legs got rounder and fatter and his tiny feet got longer until his toes poked out of the basket. Although the rest of him stayed small, his feet kept on growing and growing and growing. By the time Beckham was 13 years old, they were so large, he'd splash a puddle dry just by stepping in it. Still, Beckham's worries were few enough until his mother died. His father was a peddler and often away selling needles and pens and bringing back whatever was needed. To Beckon's surprise, one evening he came home with a new wife and three almost grown stepdaughters. Now you've got a ma'am again and three big sisters besides to watch out for you, his father explained. Watch they did. All three sisters spied on him and if anything went amiss, they shrieked, blame little Bigfoot for that is what they called him. We'd be better off without him, said their mother. At last, she told Beckon, your big feet are always in the way. It's time you went out to tend or take care of the cows. Cows are fine company, said Beckon, but I've heard of a mean speckled bull. A kick from him can send you sailing right over the rainbow. Stop fretting, said the stepmother. Not even a cow could mistake you for a man. Beckon became a herd boy. Each day at sunup, he led his father's three cows up the hill to graze on purple clover. At sun, sundown, he brought them home again. 
in between, he sat under an oak tree and kept a sharp eye for that speckled bull. One misty morning, Beckon heard a bellow louder than a thunderclap. Rocks rattled down the hill. Cows galloped out in circles, and Beckon climbed up a tree. When he dared to look down, it was right in the angry eyes of an enormous bull. The creature's face was white but splashed with rusty red like freckles on Beckon's nose. His hooves were big and broad like Beckon's feet. He twitched his long tail and pawed at the ground. Quickly, Beckon stretched, stretched out his hand and scratched him behind the ear in the place where the cows like best. We could be cousins, you and I, said Beckon, jumping down, for we look to be the same with our freckles. The bull lowered his head and with his wicked curved horns. But instead of tossing Beckon, he nuzzled his cheek. From that moment on, the bull and the boy were fast friends. Beckon told him all his troubles, while the speckled bull listened, chewing thoughtfully. The sisters tattle, said Beckon one day. The stepmother scolds me all the time. I'm fed only scraps and as soon as I shrink down to nothing. Not while I am about it, said the bull. Look into my left ear and pull out what you find there. He's gonna pull something out of the bull's ear. Beckon wasn't surprised to hear the bull talk before he began to suspect that his friend was no ordinary animal. Seeing something white poking from the table, from the animal's ear, Beckon tugged on it. Out came a tablecloth and wrapped in it a whole meal. There was bread and cheese and sausage. There were boiled turnips, a partnage pie, and oat and cakes sticky with honey. Eat what you will, said the bull. Beckon ate every crumb and licked his fingers clean. Then he rolled up the cloth and tucked it back in the bull's ear. Each day afterwards, Beckon had a noontime meal fit for a chief. Each evening, he turned down the crust of the bread his stepmother set out for supper. That boy's filling his stomach some way, the woman told her oldest daughter. Tomorrow, you yourself up to the pasture and find out how. The girl did just that, hiding behind a bush to watch Beckon as he watched the cows. At midday, the speckled bull arrived. She saw Beckon pat him, put a hand on his ear, and pull out a feast. The bull is feeding Beckon, she whispered to her mother that night. I saw it. Then we shall butcher that old speckled bull. We'll make a grand stew for him. Eyes closed, Beckon nodded at the hearth, but his ears were open, and he heard every word. At the first light, he ran to warn his friend. The bull snorted. I'll not be in the, in a pot soup. Get on my back, lad, and we'll be as gone from here as we can. With Beckon holding on tight to his horns, the bull trotted up the hill over a steep mountain and through a woods of trees. In a meadow many days from home, the bull stopped. Here we bid goodbye, he said, for it is here that the gray bull and I must fight. No, said Beckon as he threw his arms around the bull's neck. The gray bull might hurt you. The gray bull might hurt you or kill you. Beckon stared at him and said, never, please don't let that happen. Wear my tail as a belt. Use it when you need my help the most. The bull nudged Beckon gently. Do as I say. Early the next morning, the bull, gray as the sky overhead, came charging through the trees. The two bulls locked horns and fought throughout the rainy day. When evening came, the gray bull had disappeared, and the speckled bull did not make it. Beckon sat beside his friend all night. At dawn, remembering the bull's words, he cautiously twisted his tail. It spun around in a full circle and came off all at once. Beckon wrapped the tw tail twice around his waist for the last time. Reached into the animal's ear, he pulled out the tablecloth, now bare of food and fresh as new, and carefully covered the bull. He whispered goodbye. Alone, Beckon continued on his journey. 
Walking down a ro rocky ridge and into a valley, the stones cut his bare feet, and he was grateful when a gentleman on horseback offered him a ride. Where are you bound, lad? the man said. Beckon shrugged. I'm not going anywhere at all. You come along with me, the gentleman suggested. I am in need of a cow herder. Herding is what I do best, said Beckon. I have this horse, four cows, three sheep, and a donkey, all that are good-natured. What's bad temper is on the other side of the wall, and our hack. A giant, Beckon exclaimed. I'd like to see one. Take warning, the gentleman said. My last herd boy uh, was a lot bigger and stronger than you. Although he knew quite well what was meant, Beckon said at once, I'll have the job anyway. Beckon became a herder again, sleeping in the cow shed at night and taking the horse, the cows, the sheep, and the donkey out to graze all day. When they had chomped and chewed up everything in the field, Beckon climbed the stone wall to see what grew on the other side. Before him spread acres of grassy meadows and orchards of apple trees. Beckon knocked stones from the wall until it was low enough for the animals to step over. Help yourselves, he told them. That ark hack has so much, he won't mind sharing. Then Beckon climbed a tree to pick an apple for himself. Got you, a voice bellowed. A sword slashed through the tree, chopping limbs into kindling and sending Beckon tumbling on the ground. Hardly a bite of your bones. A huge and hideous giant poked Beckon with the sword. But a bite is better than nothing. Beckon's teeth began to chatter. The rest of him was scared too. Then he remembered the speckled bull's last words. He pulled off his belt and flung it at the giant. As if it were alive, the bull's tail coiled around the giant. The giant dropped his sword. Call it off, call it off, I stop. Not ever, said Beckon, not until you give me those boots. The giant glared at Beckon and he kicked off his boots. Now be gone and never come back, Beckon commanded. He climbed up on his donkey, caught hold of the bull's tail and yanked it like a bell pull. Promise? The giant's face turned purple. Promise, he puffed. As soon as Beckon let go, with a fearsome howl, the giant bounded over the wall and disappeared. Beckon buckled on the huge giant's boots. Just my size, he said. Then waving the sword, he led the herd home. The giant. Sometime later, the gentleman told Beckon, stay home with the cows today. There's trouble coming from Kinslin. Trouble, said Beckon. Tis the day of the dragon, his master shuddered. Every seven years, that wicked dragon rises from the ocean and tries to take a lady from the land. And what if she does not care for that, Beckon said. Oh, she has no choice, for he will bound her. And if not, the dragon will blow the sea onto the land and wash away the village and all the people. That is trouble indeed, said Beckon. This year, the lass is Princess Fiona, the king's own daughter. He squinted at Beckon. Don't you think? Don't you, don't you be thinking of going. The crowd might crush you just as because how small you are. Going was just what Beckon had in mind. While his master slept, Beckon put on his giant boots and thrust the sword into his bull tail belt. Then he scrambled up onto the donkey and rode off. Beckon spied the king's castle first, for it was perched high on the hill. As he trotted down the hillside into town, Beckon saw the water's edge a band of gold and a girl tied to a post at the water's edge a band of gold circled her shiny black hair and beckon knew she was a princess fiona the scene was silent only the voice of the princess was heard in the splash of the waves will no one help me she said people looked away from her some hung their heads but none moved i shall said beckon sliding off the donkey let me sharpen my sword on that dragon look behind you the princess said beckon wheeled about the sea was bubbling as it came to her boil and suddenly a monstrous dragon burst from the water flames flashed from its mouth and it barred tell turned the waves into a froth scales plated its body like armor and the nails on its toes were like daggers so they were like knives 
beckon, raise the giant's tail, the giant's sword with trembling hands. Beware, serpent, he shouted, and the battle begun. Oh, moaned the crowd as the dragon almost caught Beckon in his claws. Bravo, cried the princess as Beckett hit the dragon with his sword. But the creature acted as if the hits from the sword were pinpricks. By afternoon, Beckon was so tired, he could hardly lift the blade. Grasping his belt and said, he hurled it at the dragon. The bull's tail wrapped itself around its mighty jaws, trying to shut them. The dragon snorted and heaved, but every move tightened the belt. Soon after, two thin streams of smoke curled around its nostrils. With a sizzle, the monster sank back, back beneath the waves, taking the tail of the speckled bell, bull down with him. People cheered and rushed to beckon, almost crushing him, just as his master had warned. Then he heard, Little Bigfoot, and saw his three stepsisters ready to pounce on him, like three cats on a mouse. Beckon jumped on the donkey. Wait, cried Princess Fiona. She reached for Beckon and caught him by the boot. I want to thank you. You're welcome to be sure. Kicking the donkey, Beckon took off down the road as if the dragon still chased him, and the princess was left holding his boot. The next day, Beckon took his herd to the pasture just as always, but now he had only one boot. His bull-sized belt was forever gone, and the tip of the giant's sword was bent like a fish hook. Beckon dug a hole and buried the sword under the apple tree. That's the end of it, he said, but it wasn't. Princess Fiona still had the other boot, and she was determined to find its owner. I'll marry the one, but this foot fits this boot and none other, she insisted. It was he and he alone who saved me from the dragon. The king sent a royal messenger to crisscross the country from sea to mountains with orders to find the owner of the boot. Many wished to wed the pretty dark-haired princess. Soldiers and, and sailors and fishermen and farmers all tried on the shoe. Some stuffed their, their, their toe with sawdust, other used sheep's wool, and more than a few wore layers upon layers of socks. Still, the boot was too big for all of them. "'Tis giant size,' they grumbled. A year passed before the mas messenger arrived at the gentleman's house. When Beckon's master slipped on the boot, it slipped right off again. "'Let the lad have a go of it,' he said. "'A cow herd? the messenger winked at the gentleman, but he handed the boot to Beckon. "'Why not? Of course the boot fit. Beckon as snug as his own skin. He kicked up his heel grinned at his master and said to the astonished messenger i'm the mate to i've the mate to the cow shed soon enough beckon was on his way to kinzel again wearing both boots and upon the gentleman's fine horse how grand cried the princess when he arrived at the castle he were just the same height sir so i know we'll see eye to eye on everything he grinned at her you can call me beckon he said, for that's what my mother named me. You shall be called Prince Beckon, said Princess Fiona. She hugged him and the lad blushed as red as the hair on his head. All right, so this was our story from Ireland and it had a lot of differences from a regular Cinderella story. For one, Cinderella was a girl that lost her slipper, but Beckon was a boy that lost his boot. So what you're gonna do now is you're gonna go into Seesaw and you're gonna tell me about some of the differences and similarities that you saw between this story and either Sootface, which was our story from yesterday, or our original Cinderella story. All right, guys, thanks for listening.